Hey guys, just wanted to do a quick video on clarifying that ping, I promise, absolutely does not work at layer 3 of the OSI model. Uh, it verifies reachability between layer 3 devices, um, and not even always that, depending on what filters are doing. Uh, just going to make a quick video here to hopefully clarify what's happening with protocol headers. Uh, and why. I haven't seen anybody describe it in a, a quick, simple way if it's already out there. Uh, I apologize, but I hope this is useful for anybody interested. Um, first and foremost, what's wrong with the world <laughs> is I've seen in a lot of tactical books uh, things like uh, saying ping works at layer 3. I also just had a comment on the YouTube page that ESP works at layer 3. Uh, instead of trying to explain it in a comment, just wanted to use a video. Uh, there's a TCP IP model that exists I think it's the worst thing in the universe, maybe appropriate for like a project manager, uh, maybe a high level developer, but it, it doesn't really show what you, what you want to see. What you should be using is the OSI model. Uh, from a developer perspective, you're going to want to be more familiar with layers 5 through 7, which we're going to shove off to the side for now. Um, and we're going to focus on layer 4, layer 3, layer 2, layer 1. And we want to figure out like what is encapsulation, why do you need it, um, what does it actually do for us. Let's start at the ground and work our way up. Layer one's a physical layer. So you've got computer A, it wants to talk to computer B, it's got to send it some bits. Now normally we could use copper, right? RG45 connectors, maybe Cat5, Cat6 cable. It's a good way to send ones and zeros. Um, we could use fiber. We could use radio frequencies. We could use infrared lights. Um, one of the neat things that I just learned about was a technique, uh, they're called power hammer, which allows you to do data exfiltration over power lines. I was like, whoa, you can send things over power lines? Believe it or not, you can send things a lot of different ways. Um, all you're doing is sending a signal. It could be smoke signals, it could be a blinking light through fiber, it could be a blinking light um, <laughs> with flashlights. You, there's even a standard, honestly, for avian carrier. You could have a bird take a piece of paper from point A to point B. Check it out, there's an RFC on it. They've even got IV, avian carrier with quality of service. Um, beyond that, there, you know, there's standards for communicating in industrial control systems. There's communications uh, standards for how to stream high definition audio uh, between different devices. Uh, there's lots of different ethernet standards. So when you hook up to a network, whether it's wireless, wired, infrared, doing crazy stuff over power lines or even stranger exfiltration methods, um, it's really gonna come down to your encapsulation. And encapsulation says, you know, these different mechanisms of layer one, layer one, funny enough, sends ones and zeros. It's just bits. So there's different ways to send a one or a zero. Um, there's analog as well as digital. We can do cool stuff with even amateur radio, right? Even in Tampa, we've got a ham WAN where you can use amateur radio to send ones and zeros from point A to point B. Once you do that, we've got to figure out how do you organize these ones and zeros. Um, I'm just going to talk about Ethernet now because it's what I've got easily available and I think it's what most of you are going to deal with. Um, that Ethernet header is supposed to be a simple way for two devices on a network to communicate. You could think of it as an envelope the envelope has a source and destination, and then most importantly, it's got something called an ether type. The ether type says this is what you do with the rest of the ones and zeros that you see. This is how many contiguous ones and zeros are part of this message, and at the end of it, the next ones and zeros are part of the next message. You've got to understand the ether type. You've got to understand how big these layer two, layer three headers are. You've got to understand where the, the header ends to be able to turn uh, one header into the next. So when we look at this, we go, okay, well, we've got source and destination, and if it's Ethernet, your source and destination are MAC addresses, right? Uh, pop over to Wireshark real quick, and we can actually see that. Um, I can take a look at my Ethernet interface and see, I think it's this one. Yeah. And it's a little busy because I'm streaming my desktop to another computer which is recording, so we're gonna see a lot of packets but we can stop them right off the bat. Just in that <laughs> half a second, I already hit 1,500 packets. But we only need one, right? When looking at packets within Wireshark, breaks it down real pretty. That's our layer two, layer three, layer four header. And then 
here's what I lump together and call payload. This is SSL communication, so that's all ciphertext. Um, what we do want to look at, just for now, is starting off is Ethernet, right? My network card is set to an encapsulation of Ethernet, which means when ones and zeros come across the wire, I expect there to be a certain header size, that the size exactly of an Ethernet header. And I know in the first 48 bits, it's going to have the destination. So when I click on the destination MAC address, it's showing me below the raw data. If you're not familiar, these are the packets that have come across the wire. Each packet has a unique ID. Here is the packet breakdown uh, in a very pretty format. Here's the packet breakdown in a raw format. This is what came off the wire. If you were just looking at it, this is what you'd see without actually decoding it. The decoding happens above. So again, as soon as data comes in off the wire, we can look at the first 48 bits and go, is that my MAC address? If not, throw the packet away. I don't have to even think about the rest of it. But if that is my MAC address, go ahead and process it. I can consider who is it from and see how it highlighted that exact MAC address. And then finally, what's the ether type? And they say it's IP version four. That's cool, because when we look at the OSI model, this ether type is telling the receiving network card, here's how you decode the rest of the ones and zeros. Treat them like IPv4, opposed to IPv6. V6 header size is at least twice as big as V4. Um, it's twice as big before we get into extension headers. That's why I say at least twice as big. We've got to know how to decode things. Before we even get into V4, let's look at ether type. Your ether type um, is pretty well defined. Let's, let's come over here. And you know we think about wireless and we think about wired traffic and we're like, okay, ethernet is everywhere. That's, that's all that there is, right? Um, no, when you're using VLANs and you use VLAN tags, we start modifying that ethernet header by inserting additional fields called a VLAN tag. Um, additionally, there's different types of traffic that can work across the network. IPv4 is real common, right? But you've also got ARP address resolution protocol, turning IP addresses into MAC addresses. It's its own ether type. You know, wake on LAN for waking up computers, it's its own ether type. Trill for uh, layer two connectivities a lot of times between data centers, uh, again, has its own ether type. MPLS has its own ether type. What's interesting, you see this list they have here? There's some neat stuff in it. We've got MACSAC, we've got home plug, which is a standard for doing encapsulation over power. This is not a complete list. If you go to the IEEE website, now you see the complete list. You get to see who reserved the ether type. Was it Xerox? Was it Cisco? Was it Intel? Was it Quantrum? Was it a different university? What you start to find are there's a lot of ether types that are registered to a private organization that's not listed, and the protocol that they built is unavailable. Now this could be something from decades ago there's a project that was a bad idea that never turned into anything, and it could also be used for secret forms of communication that you're not aware of. The thing is, all ether types are organized through the IEEE, just like the first 24 bits of your MAC address come from the IEEE. So um, looking at ether type, this is the way to say, this is how you decode layer three. IPv4, IPv6, this is what you or I are used to. But once you start getting onto specialized networks or really bizarre esoteric configurations, you can start using protocols other than IP. But let's just leave it IP for our conversation today. It's just another envelope, source and destination IP addresses. So Ethernet's fine. It gets me from one network card to another network card in the same network. But if I want to get somewhere off net, that's where IP addressing comes in. Now, I might go from you know, floor one to floor two in my building, or I might go from one continent to another across the internet. V4 gives us global reachability. When we look inside of it, there's a bunch of fields. We could spend 30 minutes talking about that. But the one that is of real interest to us today is called protocol. So let's go look at it real quick. Um, just like EtherType told us what was coming at layer three, see how it says decode the rest of this as V4. You go into your IP header and you come down to protocol and it says this is gonna be a TCP header. So your IP header is only so big. See when I highlight that? There's my layer two header, there's layer three. The rest of that is a layer four header followed by some payload. 
See that? So your layer two, layer three, layer four header come up to this particular point. Uh, that and that. So that's got, that's got the full header. As he starts to break it down, we see things like a source port and a destination port. So I think that's probably enough to kind of answer your question. Um, you know, when we look at layer four, this is very much like an envelope again. We have source and destination, but at layer two, let me just grab a different pen. Layer two, we looked at MAC addresses as source and destination. Layer three, IP addresses. Layer four, port numbers. Now, what got us into this was saying, hey, does ICMP work at layer three? Does GRE work at layer three? Does ESP for IPsec VPNs work at layer three? And I said, no, but a lot of people say it does because there's tons of wrong content out there. They read it somewhere. Um, I promise that SuperDuper doesn't work like that. What's important to know is that TCP and UDP use port numbers. Not all other services do. Most of your traffic is TCP and UDP because that's how we easily allow applications to talk, right? You might send traffic, you know, as far as MAC addresses, it's gonna get from your computer to your gateway. You know, maybe your router, firewall, whatever you got. Once you get there, it's IP that's responsible from getting from your network to somewhere else across the internet. Global routing takes IP. Once you get to that particular server, because each server has at least one IP, once you get to the server, there could be different services running. So TCP port 80 is for HTTP. TCP port 25 is for SMTP, for mail delivery. So this is a, a TCP socket that's bound to a service, like SendMail. HTTP is bound to a service. It might be Apache. So it's almost like, you know, the IP address is almost like a, a, a physical address of a building. I'm trying to get to, you know, 724 Fifth Avenue. Once I get to 724 Fifth Avenue, there's a lot of things there. There's a dentist office, there's a bank, there's a financial advisor, uh, there's a private investigator, there's a dog grooming place, there's a FedEx. Which of these offices am I trying to go to? Well, it depends what type of service that I want to get. So just like a building has suite numbers, servers have port numbers. Um, does that mean that all layer four protocols have port numbers? No, they're not all made for connecting sockets between applications. ICMP is a diagnostic protocol. It tells us when things go wrong. Um, let's pop over here for one second. Looking at um, bup, bup, bup. ICMP on Wikipedia, ICMP is for error messages and for communications about what's happening. Think of it as a diagnostic codes. Um, Sure, ping uses ICMP, but it doesn't use port numbers, it uses codes. So a ping is an echo request, which is type eight. It gets you an echo reply, which is type zero. Uh, what's important to understand is that ICMP, which is its own protocol, this is the header format, it rides on top of IP. See, the ICMP header starts after IPv4 header and is identified by protocol number one. Looking at Wireshark, Wireshark told us inside of the IP header that your protocol for TCP is number six. If I have ICMP traffic and I don't, <laughs> all right, let's build some. Sweet. Come back here, we'll stop, we'll take a look at it. Here I am pinging 422. Now let me show you how that's the layer four header. Here's your layer two header, source and destination MAC. Layer three header, source and destination IP. You open it up, we go to the protocol field. ICMP is protocol number one. It rides on top of IP. It couldn't get there without it. It would be useful, uh, useless. That's why it's a layer four protocol. See, the type is eight, it's a, it's a ping request. Uh, when we start looking at these replies, they're going to be a type zero, it's a ping reply. So that's why it's a layer four header. If I had a VPN established, VPNs, again, we're working, uh, we're still working here at layer four. If I do a VPN using IPsec, it uses a protocol called ESP. ESP is a layer four header. How do we know that? We come in here, 
we take a look at Wikipedia. Here's our list of IP protocol numbers. ICMP is one. IGMP, for set up your multicast, is two. Um, you can even put IP packets and IP packets. That's gonna be four. TCP, which is real commonly used, is six. UDP, real commonly used, is 17. But there's all these other protocols. We come down here, you see GRE. You get down to 50, ESP, 51 is AH. These are the numbers that you'd find in that protocol field, and it tells the receiving device, hey, here's how you interpret the rest of those ones and zeros. Um, hopefully, this, uh, this makes encapsulation make a little bit more sense. What is it? It's just taking an envelope and putting it inside of an envelope and putting it inside of another envelope. Looking at that as a raw dump, you scratch your head and go, how do I decode all this? Well, it starts with getting your encapsulation right. If that's right, and we can read the ethernet header, it goes, this is IPv4, this is IPv6, this is ARP, um, whatever it may be. Then we look at the IP header, sure, source and destination, but that protocol says, well, this is how you do the layer four part of it. The layer four part gets decoded, and then that's where we get to that actual payload. So I hope that makes sense. Just wanted to say thanks for uh, sending the question over YouTube, gave me an excuse to jump in and make a video. Um, thanks for asking. Hope this was helpful.